Well, friends, let's get right to it. If you would open your Bibles and your Bible apps and turn with me to the good news of Luke, Luke chapter 7, we're going to begin with verse 36. And today we're looking at the story of someone who is uninvited. Now, friends, I wonder, have you ever known someone, or maybe you yourself have just showed up to a gathering uninvited? Maybe you've kind of weaseled your way into a social gathering for the food. I'm sure that's not any of you here, right? Maybe just maybe you've just bar seen someone barge into a big old event and they certainly weren't welcome at the table. Maybe it looks a little like this. Who knew Cinderella was so intense, right? <laughs> Uninvited guests, they drive us crazy. They make the situation really, really awkward. In today's story, we learn of Jesus and this woman who just barges in into this party totally unannounced to show Jesus her ultimate gratitude. Now, Jesus has been invited to this gathering at a Pharisee's house, Simon the Pharisee. If you remember, those Pharisees are those people that wanted to uh, keep all kinds of religious rules. Now, a lot of those religious rules were about what you could eat, well, what you could eat and what you could not eat. They also were about who could gather at the table and who was excluded at the table. So let's look together at Luke chapter 7, verse 36. When one of the Pharisees invited Jesus to have dinner with him, he went to the Pharisee's house and reclined at the table. A woman in that town who lived a sinful life learned that Jesus was eating at the Pharisee's house. So she came there with an alabaster jar of perfume. And as she stood behind him at his feet weeping, she began to wet his feet with her tears. Then she wiped them with her hair and kissed them and poured perfume on them. When the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, If this man were a prophet, he would have known who was touching him and what kind of woman she is, that she is a sinner. Well, don't uh, hold back, Mr. Pharisee, right? Tell us what you really think. Here in this moment, this woman is the uninvited one. She didn't make the list for the party. Now, brothers and sisters, we all have lists that we make, whether we're throwing a baby shower, planning for a wedding, a fat family gathering, we're making a list and checking it twice. There are people who just don't make the list. Those friends who don't get along with other friends, those coworkers who just bring with them a cesspool of negativity and self-loathing. There are family members in all of our families who are estranged and all of them don't make our list. Now, I realized just a few months ago that I'm not exempt from excluding people from the table. Several months ago, my husband John and I were going to pick up his great aunt Beverly at a nursing home. She was coming to eat Thanksgiving dinner with us. And so we got into the nursing home and we were really focused on how we were going to get her wheelchair into our vehicle. This was perplexing us. And so we saw the nurse, we waved, we said hi, but we kept on trucking, we kept on moving. That is until the nurse left. And when the nurse left, I whipped around and I looked at her and I realized it was my cousin. Now, my cousin and I hadn't seen each other in 14 years because, not because of anything or she or I had done, but because our families were feuding. You know, they were feuding and because we were family by associating, uh, association, we were supposed to be feuding as well. But there we were in the lobby of the nursing home, hugging and kissing and telling each other how much we miss one another. Do you know that woman looked exactly the same? I mean, after 14 years, she looked exactly the same. It was amazing. Well, we said our goodbyes, and we got John's great aunt into the car, and this deep sadness came over my heart. I thought to myself, why do we do this? Why do we fight as families and over nothing, friends? Oh, just my family, I'm sorry, <laughs> Yeah, 14 years without her at our family holiday table, uninvited. And I know I'm not alone. Many of us have friends that we don't talk to anymore, family members that just don't make the list, people in our lives that go into that category of uninvited. Well, that's the woman in today's story. She's uninvited. Jesus is reclining at this gathering, and suddenly she finds herself in a place that she shouldn't be. I mean, dinners in the first century were social affairs. The woman was allowed to be in the courtyard or at the window, but she certainly wasn't welcome at the table. And so there Jesus is, reclining at the table. Don't think table and chairs, think more like cushions on the floor. 
And in barges this woman. Now, we don't know much about her other than that she lived in the town and she lived what's described as a sinful life. Many assume that she was a prostitute, but the Bible doesn't exactly make that clear. What the Bible makes clear is that she's a sinner, and that means she's unclean. And being unclean means you're not welcome, not only around the table, but you can't touch anybody. Because if you touch another person, you are making that person unclean as well. So there she is, touching Jesus. Touching his feet, weeping over his feet. And then she does something really awkward. She lets down her hair. And let me tell you, in the first century, you don't do this. Not in public and certainly not around a group of men. And there she is weeping and crying and letting her hair down. And she takes it one step further. She takes a jar of perfume and pours it over Jesus' feet. Now friends, have you ever broken a jar of perfume in a room? It makes the entire room reek. And so I can imagine people are offended because of what she's doing, offended because of the smell. And besides all that, she's doing it all wrong. This woman, if she wanted to honor Jesus, to bless him, to honor him, she would have anointed his head, not his feet. She doesn't even know how to do this stuff right. You can almost hear the audible gasps in the room. But Jesus, he's relaxed. He's just chilling there, taking it all in. Until suddenly he notices the thoughts of Simon the Pharisee. Listen to what Simon says, Luke 7, 39. If this man were a prophet, he would have known who was touching him and what kind of woman she is, that she is a sinner. Simon the Pharisee is critical of this woman, but he's critical of Jesus as well. Why so critical? Well, I believe it's because he's afraid. It's fear. You can almost hear his protest, but it's my house, Jesus. I mean, it's easy to see why Simon is afraid. I mean, he's just invited this would-be preacher teacher over. He's a little, like, skeptical about Jesus in the first place. Rumors have already spread. At an earlier gathering of Simon's tribe, they had already accused Jesus of inappropriate dining habits. Luke 5.30 describes it this way. But the Pharisees and the teachers of the law who belonged to their sect complained to Jesus' disciples. Why do you eat and drink with tax collectors and sinners? And Jesus had answered them. It is not the healthy who need a doctor, but the who. It's the sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. So I can imagine that Simon is there just second guessing himself. Why did I invite this Jesus character over for dinner? Why did this guy even show up? He has all of these social insecurities that are arising in him. They're going to think that I'm one of them, that I'm one of the disciples, that I've drank the Kool-Aid. Doesn't Jesus know what's happening? Can't he see? If this guy was really a prophet, meaning a messenger from God, he would know what kind of woman this is, that this woman is a sinner. Friends, let's take a moment and stop right there. How does Simon know who this woman is? How does he know? Is it by what she's wearing? Does he notice the smell of her perfume? Simon, how do you have this knowledge? Just saying, Simon. So maybe there's a deeper fear at work in Simon's life. He's afraid. He's so afraid that he keeps Jesus at arm's length. I mean, he's interested in this miracle worker, this teacher, this kind of traveling guy, but but he's not interested enough to lean in, not interested enough to become a disciple, not interested enough to welcome the uninvited. Friend, I wonder if that's the place you find yourself into today. I mean, you want to be here, but, but you're a little afraid, uh, afraid to lean in, afraid to accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, afraid to welcome in the uninvited. What's at the center of your fear? What's at the center of your fear When you're trying to engage in the same habits, the same dining habits that Jesus engaged in. Now, for some of you, it's simple. You think to yourself, well, the table in my apartment is certainly not big enough to invite other people over. Or maybe you say things to yourself, well, I'm not a very good cook, so I don't think anybody wants to eat my food. But there are others of you who, when you think about inviting people over to your home, well, the dialogue goes something like this. 
Pastor Rachel, if I invited people over to my home, that would mean I'm inviting people into my life. And if I'm inviting other people into my life, that means they're going to see the real me, not like the pretend me, not what I try to like show people, not the mask that I put on, but I'd have to get real and really real. And let me just tell you, Pastor Rachel, that scares the bejeebus out of me, right? I don't want to be real. It's easier to pretend. But friends, that's what people are longing for. The real you. The authentic you. The you that is a hot, holy mess. Can I just get an amen? Amen. Yeah. We're all looking for authentic community in one another. And I believe that's what Simon was really looking for. But he was afraid. And so he says to Jesus, this is my house. I make the rules. I'm the host of the house. Jesus knew what Simon was thinking. And so he decided to tell him a story. Luke chapter uh, 7, verse 41. Two people owed money to a certain money lender. One owed him 500 denarii, the other 50. Neither of them had money to pay him back. So he forgave the debts of both. Now which one of them would love him more? Simon replied, I suppose the one who had the bigger debt forgiven. You suppose, Simon, right? Did you notice that there was sarcasm in the Bible? Isn't that awesome? Like, that is so exciting that, like, they didn't cut that out there. Simon's being sarcastic. He has an attitude. But Jesus ignored it. He said, you're right. You have judged correctly, he said. And then he turned to Simon and said, do you see this woman? I came into your house, and you did not give me any water for my feet. But she wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You did not give me a kiss, but this woman from the time I entered has not stopped kissing my feet. You did not put oil on my head, but she has poured perfume on my feet. Therefore, I tell you, her many sins have been forgiven, as her great love has shown. But whoever has been forgiven little loves little. Then Jesus said to her, your sins are forgiven. Friends, it's not like... Simon the Pharisee is shirking his duties as host. He's doing everything he's supposed to do. But this woman, she does more. What she does is an over-the-top, uncomfortable gesture of extravagant love. And the difference between the two, it's amazing. Simon the Pharisee, you know, he's a Pharisee. He's a holy man. And this woman, it's clear, she is a sinner. Simon the Pharisee, he keeps his post, his rightful post as host, and she, she gets on her hands and knees as though she's a servant, as though she's a slave. Simon wants to be seen as someone who's, who's you know, in his rightful position, and this woman, she doesn't care about her reputation. She wants to give her all to Jesus. The compare and contrast with Jesus couldn't be more clear. The uninvited one, has become the exalted one. The uninvited one has become the honored one. The uninvited one has become the host. This sinner has been forgiven. Simon the Pharisee, can't you see it? This is the kingdom of God coming from heaven to earth. I'm turning everything upside down. This is the great reversal, Simon. If you want to know what God looks like, If you want to see God at work, look at me. Look at this woman, Simon. This is where heaven and earth are colliding. Friends, we're going to see this great reversal over and over and over again in the book of Luke. It's what Jesus was all about. We read about it in the gospel of Luke chapter 4 when Jesus was reading from the scroll of Isaiah. He said, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he's anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He sent me to proclaim freedom to the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free, and to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Jesus proclaimed good news to the poor. Pastor Mike, uh, Pastor Emeritus here used to say, if it's not good news to the poor, it's not what? It's not good news. It's not the gospel. Now, a lot of times when we hear that word poor, we think materially poor. And it means that, but it means so much more. When you look at the Hebrew word, that Hebrew word not only means the materially poor, but it means people of lowly status. People like orphans and widows and the elderly. People who are socially rejected. People like Matthew, the tax collector, even though he's wealthy, I mean, he's not materially poor. He's socially poor. People who find themselves on the outside. 
So Jesus is saying, I'm bringing good news to the outsider. I'm bringing good news to the person that the religious folk rejected. I'm bringing good news to the uninvited one. Why? Because Jesus eats with everybody. Molly Cruz knows a thing or two about being the uninvited one. Because of her own life choices, some circumstances, she found herself drowning in drug abuse and being human trafficked. And then one day, just like this woman, Jesus came into her life and changed everything. This week, I sat down around a table with Molly, and we were having a cup of coffee. And this is what happened. So I think about your story, uh, probably one of the most powerful moments in your story is when you had been back out in traffic, you know, you were, you're back into the life that you had come out of and then went back into and your family hawks you down. <laughs> what happened there? Um, well, I had at this point been out on the streets for approximately two years and, um, um, and and they didn't know where to find me, so I guess they had all decided that um, they were going to let a couple vans and they were going to just drive around until they found me. So um, my aunt and my cousins and my sisters all just loaded up in a van and started driving around on Hudson Street in Columbus where they'd heard I'd been. They started um, approaching people and asking them, you know, giving people money to tell them where I was at. And they spent two days doing this, and they pulled up on me. Um, I was walking in the rain one day, and I thought that I was getting my next John. This van pulls up, you know, and I think, you know, at this point in my life, that's my savior. You know, I get to get out of the cold. I get to, you know, get high, and that's all what I lived for at that time. And the door opens, and it was, it was my own family. And I was so, so embarrassed <laughs> turn around and ran. But the thing about that, though, is that even though at that point I didn't go get clean, they tried. When my heart became ready, I remembered that love that they had shown me at that moment. Like, I just never thought in my life that anybody could love me enough to hunt me down. Like, this is my family who's never used drugs, never been around anybody in that lifestyle, you know? And they literally did that exact thing that I've been doing now, just jumped into the streets to find something they love. So share with me uh, that moment that you really first encountered Jesus. <laughs> um, the first time that I encountered him, really was when I first went out with several soldiers. I was still in Safe Harbor at the time. I had some community service hour requirements that I had to fill for the programming. And I had heard of this sidewalk soldiers that go pass out purses and um, I don't know what struck, something struck me and grabbed hold of my heart and said, I really want to do that for my community service hours. So we pull up to the first place we pull up to is a hotel where I had spent a lot of time being trafficked, abused, be, I mean, I had been probably the most miserable state of my life in the same hotel room. And it was literally the first place we pull into. And I'm like, and first thing I'm going is, oh my gosh, I cannot do this. Like, I'm freaking out thinking like, what do I have to offer this woman that's standing in front of this, this room that's probably in the same place that I was. But uh, it was just like God just took me by the hand and he pulled me out of that car and I could see God working in me. And that was really powerful to realize that I had that power. And to realize that this like, place doesn't have to have that meaning anymore. Anymore. You know, it's amazing to me. Like You are the physical representation of Christ's unconditional love to these women. Like, you are... You are right in the lowest of low with them, saying, um, you can pick your head up. Um, you're beloved. You're a beautiful daughter of the living God. 
if God can, like, if God can love me, <laughs> I am the worst of the worst, the lowest of the low. I've sinned with the best of them. Um, and, and everybody can save anybody. And God loves us all. Like, he's loved me all along. I believe we should do that for every single human being. Period. Exclamation mark. No matter where they find themselves. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Molly Cruz has this incredibly contagious faith and she goes out on the streets and she really does hawk these women down in places and spaces that she has been once in her life and God has taken her mess and turned it into God's miracle. And friends, God wants to do the same in our lives as well. We all have a mess that God wants to turn into God's miracle. We all have things in our lives that God wants to use to reach other folks for Jesus. We just got to be willing to be used by Jesus, to invite people to Jesus' table. And so this week, I, I want to push you. I want you to do something that maybe is going to make you uncomfortable. I want you to think about your list. Who are those folks in your life that are the uninvited ones? The coworker, the family member, the friend. And I want you to reach out to them and maybe just maybe invite them over for dinner. Have a cup of, a cup of coffee with them. Maybe all you can do is send them a text message that says, I'd love to see you around the family Easter table. Whatever it is, say a little prayer through the power of the Holy Spirit. Jesus, help me love this person. Help me pull them in. Now, for some of you, the thought of that is just overwhelming. So let us give you a, a kind of a first step. We're going to be hosting what we call open tables all over the Miami Valley from Vandalia to Tip City, from Trotwood to Troy, uh, places and spaces where our own Gingham family are going to open their homes so that we can gather for meals. All we ask is that you sign up on the Gingham app or go out to the Connection Center and sign up today and then bring a something to share, your go-to meal, even if that is, yes, Kentucky Fried Chicken, right? Whatever it might be, you bring it and share it. And then just see what Jesus will do. It's amazing. What happens when we gather around tables? That's what Simon, the Pharisee, was really longing for. Jesus to be at his table. What the uninvited woman was uh, looking for, a place of belonging, a place of community. And brothers and sisters, I believe that is at the core of who we are. We want to know that we're part of God's family. Jesus eats with everybody. We are so grateful for the grace and the love that you pour over us, that we receive through the sacrament of Holy Communion. Lord Jesus, as we receive that grace and love, let us not hoard it to ourselves, but let us share it with every single human being we encounter. We pray this in Jesus' name, and everybody said, amen.